Hey, good evening, everyone. Welcome back to my channel, Gray1951. Back for another episode of Movies from A to Z. And tonight we're on letter D. So I've chosen this Betty Davis Camp classic from the year 1964. It's called Dead Ringer. Dead Ringer. Known in the UK as Dead Pigeon for some strange reason. I don't know why they changed it. But anyway, also Carl Malden is in it. Peter Lawford. Gene Hagen. Estelle Winwood, George McCready. Um... Philip Carey, directed by Paul Henry. Now, Paul Henry, of course, had worked with Betty Davis in two other films as an actor. Back in 1942, they made a, a classic uh, woman's picture called Now Voyager. I love this movie. And he, he was her um, romantic co-star in that film. And their other co-star was Claude Rains. Four years later, the same three actors starred in another film at Warner Brothers called Deception. And so Paul Henry had done a little bit of directing during the 1950s and up into the 60s. And it was the first and only time that they worked together with her acting to his direction. So now this movie is, well, it's rather, it's an old-fashioned story. And there's a good reason for that because it, it had actually been owned by Warner Brothers since the 1940s. And it, it plays in a way like something Betty Davis could have made back in 1945. She was not the original choice to play these uh, twin sisters, Edith and Margaret. The the first actress who was going to play was Lana Turner, and for some reason she decided she didn't want to play twins. So what we have here, Betty Davis plays Edith Phillips, a woman living in Los Angeles. Uh, it's contemporary Los Angeles in 1964. At the beginning of the film, she is getting off of a city bus at a cemetery. She's going to um, witness the burial of a man named Frank DeLorca. This is a man that she had been in love with and was going to marry about 20 years uh, before when they were both in the military. And uh, it turned out that Frank had a chance to uh, go on leave and go back to California without Edith. And she said, make sure you uh, you uh, meet my twin sister Margaret while you're while you're there. Big mistake because Frank and Margaret end up jumping into bed together. And after all that is over, Margaret announces, I'm pregnant. So Frank decides to do the right thing and uh, say goodbye to Edith, sorry, and marry Margaret. So, of course, the two sisters split up completely after that. No contact for 20 years. Uh, Edith is bitter, angry. Yeah, and as if all this stuff happened last week rather than 20 years ago. She's never gotten over it, never got married, had a rather a difficult life. She spent a lot of years taking care of their father with no help at all from Margaret, who who married into wealth. Frank was came from a wealthy family and he did very well in business. And they're living in, in a section of LA that uh, in a beautiful mansion with, and Margaret has everything just, you know, hot and cold running jewels, clothes all over the place, servants at her beck and call, limousines, chauffeurs, the whole bit. And, well, anyway, Edith is is running a bar in a, a sort of a rundown section of L.A., uh, a bar called Edie's Place, and she's living in a, a small apartment on top of the bar. And she's three months behind in her rent. So her life is much different than Margaret, much different than it would have been had she married Frank DeLorca, and she's just never gotten over it. So she, she sees her sister at the funeral, and Margaret invites her to come back with her in the limousine to visit the mansion so they can talk for a while. For some reason, Edith, Edith decides to go, and they do not get on very well. Margaret is throwing clothes at her, saying, here, take this. Maybe you like this mink coat. Here, here's some money. And she just really angers Edith, and Edith ends up saying, to hell with you, and walks out. But before she does, she asks her, so where is the child? The, the child that you had with Frank. And Margaret tells her, well, the baby died before it was a year old, and I was never able to have any more. So Margaret accepts, I mean, Edith accepts this as being the truth. So she walks out, she says, to hell with you, and she walks out. And the chauffeur takes her back to her neighborhood bar, her apartment, and they're talking on the way home. And Edith finds out that there never was a child. So she comes to the conclusion that Margaret lied about the whole thing just to get Frank to marry her, ruining her life. So she's even more angry and bitter than she was before she found this out. And she comes up with the idea that she's going to invite her sister to come over to her apartment and 
kill her, make it look as though Edith has committed suicide, and then take Margaret's place and go back to the mansion, go back to her life, the life that Edith feels she should have had, she would have had, had she married Frank to Lorca. So that's the story. Now, complicating all of this is the fact that Edith is involved with a, a policeman, a man named uh, Jim, can't remember his last name, but played by Carl Malden, a police sergeant who loves her, absolutely adores her and wants to marry her. And he's planning to retire from the police uh, force very soon. He wants Edith to sell the bar and then take her to live on a chicken ranch. A chicken ranch. And Edith is not terribly happy about the idea of going to live with Jim on a chicken ranch. And especially now that she's found out that she could have had all this, this wealth and all these clothes and all the jewelry and all the status living as Margaret Delorca. So... So she doesn't tell Jim, of course, what she's planning. And there's this long sequence up in Edith's, Edith's apartment when her sister comes to visit her where she goes through the motions of, uh, you know, all these these step-by-step uh, -step killing Margaret, uh, changing her hair, changing their clothes, and putting on Margaret's morning clothes and walking out and getting in the limo and going back into her life. So that's how the story starts out. And it gets very complicated because obviously Edith has not thought a lot of this through. Well, she hasn't thought anything really, really just uh, committing the murder and writing out a suicide note, making everybody think that Edith is the one who's dead. She doesn't realize that somebody's going to ask her to start signing checks with Margaret's handwriting, that, that she's going to have to know the combination to the safe where the the jewels are kept, all these things. She doesn't realize that servants are going to be watching her constantly and wondering why is she acting so differently? Why is she why has she started smoking again when she hasn't smoked for 20 years? And all of a sudden, and, and there's a this gigantic dog, I think it's a Great Dane, that was Frank's dog who used to hate Margaret, would just growl at her every time she would be around and Margaret stayed away from her. Well, the dog decides that uh, he takes one sniff of Edith and he falls in love with her and all of a sudden people are wondering why does why has the dog all of a sudden started following her around. She also doesn't know that Margaret had a lover played by Peter Lawford, a much younger man. And that, that gets very complicated as well. So anyway, that's the story. It's it, it, it's great fun to watch. Um, Betty Davis, I think she does a good job in this, but in a way, she's very stiff. Betty Davis was turning into a very kind of a, a an overly regal actress. Nothing like she had been in Baby Jane just two years earlier, where she just very animated, very emotional, and just, you know, spitting her lines out with, with great feeling. And just two years later in playing this this part, she was she was very, very um she seemed like she never never changed the expression on her face for either character and she was just very, very stiff. And maybe it was the way Paul Henry was directing her. I don't know. I still love the film. There are a lot of good reasons to love it. But uh, it's it's not a great great performance by Betty Davis. She's she's very physically active. She has to do all this stuff to um, you know taking off Margaret's clothes and and doing all this physical stuff. She works very hard in this film. And of course they use the split screen technique when the sisters are together. Except that in a couple of scenes, like when they're riding in the, the limousine, sitting side by side, and when they're first walking into the house, one is in front of the other. They actually use another woman. I can't remember the name of the woman. I think the first name was Connie. I think she may have been Betty Davis' stand-in for, for a, a number of years, but she did kind of resemble Betty Davis, and especially with the black veil over her face, it was kind of believable. But for the rest of it, they used uh, the split-screen technique, and of course, maybe it was this Connie who was... Uh, playing the, the, the dead body that, that Betty Davis was working on when she was trying to disguise herself and disguise her sister. I, I really don't know, but it was some of it was pretty well done. Had a lot of, you get to see Betty Davis in a slip. That's pretty exciting. And uh, you get to hear her sing a couple of bars of the old, <clears throat> the old song, Shuffle Off to Buffalo. That's, that's fun. And she smokes something like, I read this on Wikipedia. They actually gave the number of cigarettes she smokes in the film. It was astronomical. She's constantly smoking in this film. And she she plays well with people like um, 
Carl Malden, who gives a really good performance in this film. Peter Lawford is a lot of fun. Gene Hagen is in it. Uh, she's Gene Hagen was her last film. Of course, she was the one. She was the one who was in Singing in the Rain, with the one with the scratchy voice, and she also was in um, um, the Asphalt Jungle. Made some really good films early in her career. Unfortunately, she later on in life she she was in ill health and she died very young at the age of 54 in 1977 and i think yeah dead ringer was her last picture um now one of the one of the characters in the film one of the actresses in the film was uh paul henry's daughter monica she was playing betty davis's um uh, servant Janet so she's in it quite a bit and I don't know if she was ever an actress again after this but I'm trying to think of what else I wanted to say the, the film did fairly well there was another film that came out that year with Joan Crawford called Straight Jacket a much more low budget uh, exploitational film of course directed by William Castle and uh, you put these two together it's kind of a nice double feature but this this made a lot more money than did Dead Ringer I don't think that made Miss Davis very happy but uh, of course Betty Davis went on after after baby Jane she went on to make a lot more films in her career and lived a lot longer than Joan Crawford Joan Crawford didn't actually make that many more films uh, ended her career in films in 1970 but Betty Davis of course went on until uh, almost until she she passed away in 1989 so yeah very much worth seeing great fun um, yeah, I don't know what else to say about it. That's probably all I want to say. Music by Andre Previn, who of course passed away just about a week ago. May he rest in peace. Very interesting little movie, Dead Ringer. I just saw that um, on YouTube that my friend Ian has posted his film for movies from A to Z, and he picked another Betty Davis movie called uh, Dark Victory, which of course is a, a classic film from the Golden Age and, and a it helped a lot better than Dead Ringer, but uh, maybe not as much fun. So, okay. Good night.